What are you up to? Chillin', chillin'. Well, uh, we did get your DNA results back this morning. Would you like to go over them? Oh, you did? Oh, great. Sure. Why not? I, I'm here. <laughs> let's, uh, let's do that. All right, Mr. Marsh, here's your DNA and me portfolio. This shows that we actually found a mix of a few things in your regional ancestry. Really? Like Native American? Like, like a little bit? No, we didn't find any trace of any Native American DNA in your test. Nuts. But as you can see here, we found that you're about 43% Northern European, 37% Mediterranean, and 18% Southwest Asian. In fact, your genetic profile most closely matches your standard Caucasian British person. <sighs> and you might be interested to know that you are actually 2.8% Neanderthal, which is fairly high. Neanderthal? What the hell is that about? Well, the Neanderthals were actually a species that was wiped out by Homo sapiens. Wiped out? All of my people? Yes, but you see, because of some crossbreeding, some people like you still possess Neanderthal DNA. Isn't that interesting? Crossbreeding? Rape. You're telling me that my ancestors were raped and then eradicated by you. You may walk with me through the cellar door. A storm is coming, Francis. A portal to a more skeptical world. Cellar Door Skeptics begins right now. Prepare for the revolution with your host, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. Oh, welcome to episode 101 as we reboot Cellar Door Skeptics. Thank you all so much for joining us for another amazing episode. And yes, we have a that lot of changes. We do. We have a lot of changes that are coming at you. And hopefully, hopefully you all will be able to weigh in on our poll that Hannah is going to link to on the Facebook page. He's going to post the poll. He's going to link it to the top of the page. No matter what, for the next month, we're going to actually have this poll up that you could tell us, hey, I like the new format. I don't like the new format. And if you have any suggestions, send us an email at cellardoorskeptics at gmail.com. If you like the new format, though, take our links and share it with your friends and say, hey, guys, you should listen to this new, more amazing format that Cellar Door Skeptics has put together. Because we put a lot of effort into this, man. We, we've, we took two weeks off. We did. We took two full weeks off. And we actually sat down. We pre-planned a bunch of shows. We've gone out and recorded a bunch of extra audio for it. We're going to have extra clips for those of you who are Patreon providers. Yes, so if you're a Patreon subscriber, you're going to get to hear extra content. If you're not, head over to patreon.com forward slash Cellar Door Skeptics, and you can actually hear all about the new amazing things that we are providing for everybody and all the crazy swearing that goes on behind the scenes as we try and <laughs> pre-record a bunch of different segments we used to do live. And we should also do what everyone else I hear podcasts because I've been listening to all kinds of inspiration. Apparently, you're supposed to like go to the iTunes and like say if you think we're horrible or awesome and rate us and and all kinds of good things there because it means a whole bunch. Uh, I, as yeah, far as I, think I can you, tell, I think you like five five gold stars, don't you? Yeah, yeah. That's, you love that's, the stars. That's, that's what I keep. That's what I keep telling myself. I say I love the stars, just like the old uh, the old. Oh, it was that Quiznos? We love the subs with the up, upside down gerbil man face things. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting back into my Super Bowl commercial memory here for a moment there, but just just rate us and tell us what you think because it really does matter. And I mean, we we're trying something new. We're trying some 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 really deep divey edited up things to see if people like that instead of uh, the talking heads going nuts on ourselves like we do because we're we're pretty rough on ourselves. For uh, trying to figure out what you, what you guys think you'll like, so here, here's to the new stuff. Exactly, and uh, one of the big things that we have coming up here, one of the big, you know, hiccup. <laughs> yeah, one of the things. <laughs> one of the big things that we have that we're introducing is uh, different types of segments. You know, so before we try to do a lot of, uh, we picked articles and we just did articles, and and so now we're actually kind of doing a little bit more deep dive research. So. You know, the science segments are changing a little bit. We will do a science segment where both of us talk about it. But, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to focus on specific topics 
that will allow us to continue to provide exceptional content over the next year and a half that we hopefully will be doing this. We also have another amazing announcement. Uh, For those of you that are listening, you'll be the first people to hear this. We have been asked to participate in the Michigan Atheist Conference next April. Uh, We don't have a lot of details. We don't have a lot of information on it, but we will be officially at the next Michigan Atheist Convention coming up here in April of 2018. So if you've never met us or you want to see our ugly mugs in person, and yes, I will force Hannah to wear a suit, and I will wear a suit at the same time. Maybe we'll even wear matching suits. I don't know. Do suits have pants? Uh, I'm not saying you have to wear pants. I'm just saying you got to wear a suit. So if your personal suit has a pants to it, you (laughs) you must wear it. I I always have a pants. I always have a pants hidden somewhere. I don't know. It's going to be awesome. We don't know exactly what we can announce as far as what's being planned for the uh, the conference yet. So we're just going to say we're 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 planning on going, and uh, we're going to be giving um, some some interesting uh, chitter chatter speeches. But the uh, we don't know exactly what we're allowed to say if they've announced themes or anything like that. So all we can tell you right now is that we're going to be there. Exactly. And so if you're listening to this and you want us to be there, email us at Cellar Door Skeptics if you want anything. Uh, to, for us to talk about at the convention, uh, we may even host like a live podcast right out of my out, out of our room. We may even do that. I, I I think we'll do that. I think we will record a podcast, whether it's live or not. We're going to actually record a podcast with um other people that are there. So I I'm actually working on acquiring two more microphones uh, that I found online, plus Hannah's. So there'll be four microphones going around. So we'll be able to have like a little roundtable conversation at Michigan yeah. Atheists. Sounds like a good time, man. So, well, uh, we've, we've we've got through quite a bit of stuff. Is there any more announcements? Or are we going to ca- tackle on some some meat here? Because I have I'm hungry. I have no <laughs> no more announcements. I I've announced myself out. Um, we we do have you know again, like I said, our our goal was to try and improve the quality of the show to give you a little bit more content. Um, that you know we felt was a little bit more lacking. We, the goal of this was to force us to provide better content instead of just coming together and talking about things. So um, the, what are, tonight well, what you're going to actually hear yeah. a couple of different segments that you never heard before. You know, Hannah's going to actually do a, a very deep dive segment into science. He's going to talk. He's going to, yeah, he's going to talk about a crisper and, and no, we're not talking about the, the thing in your <laughs> fridge that keeps your vegetables crisp. We're talking about something else. And then, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about an experience I had with my daughter uh, about a week and a half ago that uh, is kind of one of those things that I feel is going to be kind of a theme going forward. Um, One of the big things that I felt a burden for is how to be a secular parent in a religious society. And yes, I'm not an expert on this, but, you know, it's one of those things where I felt a need to, you know, start to speak out because I have uh, children that are now participating in the religious world. And I kind of want to know how does other people, you know, tolerate this. And so, you know, next, next, not next week, but the week after, I actually have an interview with a gentleman who's in a relationship with a Christian wife, and she's still a Christian and taking her kids to church. So we're actually going to talk about in a couple of weeks how this gentleman copes with this right here in the Grand Rapids community and, you know, how other people can learn from his experiences and hopefully take them and make them successful. But tonight, you know, the first topic we're going to get into, you know, because we're going to talk about a couple of very important topics. But the the first topic we're going to talk about is Christopher Columbus Day. It's a little late, but it's we got there eventually. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little late. We took two weeks off, so it's okay. It was yeah, it was during our our break, but it's gonna be it's gonna be a good one. I mean, everybody got kind of got their arguing out, and now we're going to talk a little bit. A little bit more specific. Exactly. And, and you know, the big thing here is it's kind of funny because, you know, normally South Park floats that libertarian line, right? Oh, yeah. But as you heard earlier, South Park had a whole episode right about Christopher Columbus Day. And I have another clip I want to play real quick. Hey, are you are you open for another clip? Uh, uh, we, did we play one already? We did. We played one at the intro. Oh, yeah. Well, what's it going to matter? Let's fire it up. All right. So one of the larger debates about Christopher Columbus Day is should it be Indigenous Peoples Day? And it's kind of funny because South Park actually tackled this this conversation, right? And they tackled the conversation in two different ways. They had a gentleman who was trying to atone for past sins and trying to change 
the future, right? Because he's changed his mind, changed his opinion. And then you have the children, on the other hand, who are just saying, hey, I don't care what this day's about. I just want a day off of school. (laughs) Guys, what are you doing? It's over, Eric. We have to come to school on Monday. Just face it. I'm not facing anything. We still have time. There has to be a way we... Dude, there's nothing we can do, all right? Okay, I see. Is that what Columbus did? Just give up? On his dream? No. Columbus believed that kids should have a day off ski. And even when his own country wouldn't support his cause, Columbus said, Fine, I'll go find a new land where kids can have that day off. Eric, just let it go. And when Columbus sailed to distant places, only to find people already there who said, No, stay off our land. We want our kids to have to go to ski. He said, No, it's just one day in October. They need a break. You guys can all give up, but I'm not. Because in 1492, Columbus got us all a day off ski. With just three ships he sailed over, so we could have some me time in October. And yes, millions were slaughtered and throats were cut. But if we don't get that day off a of ski, then for what? Come on, guys. There's something else we can try. Exactly. And so it's kind of funny because, you know, <laughs> we just we just listen to them, right? The kids only care about this. And, and the conversation in my household actually came up about this, right? You know, and I'll be honest, none of us are Native Americans in my household. You know, like, I think I'm like 124th Native American, you know, is my guess. Like, I am technically Native American, but on such a small, minute process, you know, part of my personality, it's also not part of our um, upbringing. You know, nobody in my family actually identified it as, as Native American. But it was kind of funny. We used to go witness the Native Americans in Canada, you know, when I was younger. <laughs> But, you know, the, the funny thing was, is my kids came home and, you know, we were sitting at the dinner table and I knew it was Columbus Day and I knew they didn't have the day off. And I kind of said, hey, what's going on, guys? What did you guys learn about at school today? And my youngest was like, yeah, dad, Christopher Columbus supposedly discovered the world. But we just learned today he really didn't. And I was like, oh, <laughs> really? Like, that's news to me. When I was a kid, we had to learn about the Santa Maria, you know, all the different ships. And we had to learn about, you know, how they, you know couldn't do anything so the native americans had to help them and then you know we learned that they worked together in peace <coughs> we all know that's not true and stuff <laughs> yeah we all know that's not true we all know they used them and then slaughtered them <laughs> like like we know this as adults but you know as children yeah they can't give you that scenario right i mean can you imagine telling a three four year old or even a five year old hey by the way um, our ancestors came and killed a bunch of people you'd be like no, no, no that didn't happen that didn't happen come on you know we didn't we didn't kill a bunch of people and then you you have to actually tell these children yeah this is a horrible thing it's kind of like i can imagine like if you were in germany and they like get to the part about you know world war ii and they're like oh yeah man. um we don't we don't we don't know what happened uh <laughs> we just know it's really bad and like me as an outsider would be like hold on teacher hold on why are we not telling these kids that uh a nazi regime took over and slaughtered millions and millions of innocent people. Why are we not talking about this? Like, and that's kind of how I feel about Columbus Day. Like, we we could talk about how in Germany they're now they feel ashamed and they don't celebrate, you know, Nazi Day. <laughs> they don't have a Nazi Day. If they don't have a day where Hitler's like, oh, ooh, hey, he has some good points, you know. They they like they distance themselves <laughs> he from some it. Good points. But we we what do we do? Oh, we sit man. here and we embrace Columbus. We we talk about a whole fucking national holiday for Columbus. And and yeah. how does that feel to the rest of the Native Americans that have to live with us? You know, like I work with a Native American. We don't talk about it. You know, like I no. I should have asked them. I should have asked them. Hey, how do you feel today? But I don't I don't know where that line is. And and some of these just wants to go. Hold on a second. Our nation is continuing to celebrate the slaughter of the people that used to live here before us, and yet we have the audacity to name a national holiday after this. Well, it's not. It's yeah, incredulous. It's not, it, it's not quite. Well, it is now, thanks to Mister Mister Trump. But uh, up until uh, this most recent whatever that uh, Trump did, um, there was only 34 states that recognized Columbus Day as a legal holiday, and some U.S. cities, cities uh, such as Minneapolis and Seattle, are the ones that renamed it to Indigenous Peoples Day. So depending on what city you're in, changes whether or not they recognize it as a legal holiday 
or or what state you're in as well. And then um, obviously it's been changed now. I'm I'm gonna guess you you've got this thing highlighted in your little section here. Is this is this a direct quote? Is this a direct quote from Donald Trump? Yes, and and so that's you're kidding. (laughs) No, I'm not. I'm not kidding. This is from the White House. Literally, the White House has this statement. At the end of their article, they says this. They say, in commemoration of Christopher Columbus's historic voyage, the Congress, by joint resolution of April 30th, 1934, and modified in 1968, as amended, has requested the president proclaim the second Monday of October of each year as Columbus Day. Now, therefore, I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of Cheeto, I mean America, Uh, by uh, virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim October 9th, 2017, as Columbus Day. I call upon the people of the United (laughs) States to observe this day with Cheetos and appropriate ceremonies, and activities. I also direct the flag of the United States in display on all public buildings on the appointed day in honor of our diverse history as we slaughtered, I mean, and all who <laughs> contribute to this, the shaping of this nation. Now, I get it, right? You know, in all fairness, Donald seems- Trump had to say that. I mean, it's, it's part of this written act. He could have, he could have argued against it. Just like he could have denied Nazis, and he didn't. But he could have argued against this, and he chose not to. And that's fine, right? I mean, that's... Is, is the flag thing normal? Like, we're, like I, I, I don't know. I'll be I honest, I don't know. I direct that the flag should be displayed on all public buildings. Like, I, as far as I know, they already are, if they're public <laughs> buildings. Because, I mean, I've never seen a public building that didn't have some form of the state flag, the county flag, if they have one, and the United States flag. I mean, that's just part of being public. So like it's weird to like uh, I request this. I mean this is like this weird <laughs> this is weird um, White House press briefing that kind of sort of pulls in the battle over the NFL. I don't know, man. It just seems weird. That it's like compulsory flag stuff. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> worship. I, I that that I don't know. Um, I, I I'll be honest. I, I I really genuinely do not know exactly whether we fly the flag or not. I've never seen a public building that didn't have it. So it seems like a redundant thing to say, but regardless, so I, I just real quick, just picked on a couple of things for um, so, the, the, the facts that people have been saying, you know, yeah. everybody always talks about him never or him getting to America. It's like the first one. Uh, I did not know. I thought he actually got to the mainland. He only got to the Caribbean. That's as far as he got into it. So like, where's the discovery? I mean, in the first place, just because of that, that's as far as he got into it. I mean, I don't know. I know a lot of people have been poking to things like that, but um, then there's the um, the um, the horrible things that he did. Because I did also, I did not know until this year that he was put in jail. Like he's brought right back in uh, and changed. And so we talked already about the uh, the city governments and stuff with the Indigenous Day, uh, the Indigenous People Days. But I didn't know also that the the Spanish government brought him back in chains, or at least his um, I guess his other shipmates did. When the king and queen found out how he was treating the natives, he was stripped of his nobility and spent weeks in jail, six weeks. Uh, and so like we knew that he treated them them poorly. I mean, that that was that was kind of an um an expected thing, but the. Well, at least what we've heard people say about whenever you hear about the criticism and stuff. But apparently they they um, they, they left 39 men the first time they were in the Caribbean and uh, he went to Spain and then back. Well, those 39 men were killed because they were treating the native women horribly. Uh, and so when he came back with 1,200 men, obviously they just went to town and it's raping and pillaging the natives. Um, I don't I don't know how how much you wanted to go into. Uh, because uh, I they had one uh, one account by uh, Christopher Columbus's friend Michelle de Coino, and it, I mean it's vivid. We could we could give people the link if they want to read it. Um, but I mean it's pretty it's pretty intense, pretty aggressive. It's pretty much just uh, yeah. an attack on a woman. So well, we'll let someone else read it if you want. Yeah, and, and some of me, you know, the reason why I brought this up is because you know 
we've kind of talked about the statues a little bit and, and taking down Confederate statues in the past, right? The yeah. whole point of talking about this is because should we be celebrating Columbus Day? You know, should we be celebrating the mass murder? Should we be even be celebrating a gentleman whose goal was to find Asia and ran into another yeah. continent, thought it was Asia, didn't have the wherewithal to understand it, didn't care, and then came back and, you know, basically lied about it. And yet we and have a whole national federal holiday that neither one of the, even Obama didn't challenge this. Obama <laughs> didn't challenge this. So Obama made proclamations. And that's why I can, I can only fault Trump so much. I mean, I can only say, hey, Trump, you know, you should have done this. You should have done something different. I don't agree with you. But at the same time, we sit here and we worry about all the different, you know, how people view us. And in all fairness, Trump did anything different than Obama did. Obama acknowledged Columbus Day. He issued a very similar statement to Trump. It wasn't that much different. And... The difference yeah, it's just, for me when is... When are you going to make the change? Yeah, who's going to make the change? Who's going to stand up? Who's going to be on the sidelines? Why are we watching different areas change and not the federal government? And, and if, for example, uh, there's an opinion article from the LA Times called Why LA is Right to Replace Columbus Day with Indigenous People Day. And for me, you know, we could talk about the atrocities of Columbus. We could, we could do that. We could talk about how Americans slaughtered... A, you know, Native Americans for how many years and how we continuously thought we had the right to own that land. It's kind of a white people thing, I think, you know, <laughs> but the bigger thing to me is how do we make this indigenous people days? How do we go about changing the culture, changing the lifestyle, changing how people see things so that they no longer want to celebrate a mass murderer who's murdered more people in all fairness than again Ed Jin did <laughs> want to change. And so the, the article says after much debate, both the Los Angeles city council and the LA County board of supervisors le recently voted to replace Columbus day holiday with indigenous people's day beginning no later than 2019. Although many, this seems like a long overdue change, others wondered why our elect elected officials have ventured into this political ticket. Now, why would they do that? To me, it kind of seems like we want to talk about how do we change appropriation, right? How do we change atrocities? If you had a federal, you know, statue up that was of General E. Lee, would you not want to take it down? If you, you who cares what the history is? Take it, put it in a museum, right? I've I've yeah. been to the north, right? I've been up north <laughs> of Michigan, and I've seen some of the museums where they have some of the conquerors, we can call them, right, in the museums, and they talk about the lives. But they don't have statues and monuments on the streets. You don't walk in Michigan and go, hey, that guy slaughtered a bunch of Native Americans in Michigan. Good for him. We want a statue of that guy. No, he, he belongs in a museum. I just yeah. a place I, I don't learning. understand why this is not a more popular idea. I would say Clarissa of Columbus. Well, first off, I understand basically everybody's argument that Christopher Columbus didn't discover what he said he discovered and he was horrible to the people. But here's an interesting thing that I also am relatively uh new to this is that well not not particularly, but um what are we what are we just celebrating about Christopher Columbus. Like, what is it? Well, he, he's the first person to the Americas. No, actually, he wasn't. Um, he, most scholars and people who um, who are historians attribute that to a Norse Viking named Leif Erikson, who managed a whole four centuries earlier than Columbus, going up north and then getting into the, uh, the Canadian areas. Uh, but... Either way, so if Columbus wasn't the first person here, he was the, okay. He was the first person into the Caribbean. Where's what are we just what are we celebrating? I mean, this is kind of like when you talk about um, if you look at our history books and you look at uh, whitewashing of American history, and you don't see you know the horrible things that we did in the, the Latin Americas during the uh, 60s and 70s, and a lot of those things. That those won't be in there. You won't see uh, a a very clear. Uh, rendition of slavery in uh, Jim Crow in the South during the civil rights and the, the American slavery period. I mean, in some places you're seeing that the Civil War wasn't even caused by slavery. 
and this is this is you know it's not so much I wouldn't say cultural appropriation, but it's it's um, we're whitewashing history to you know the things that we like, and so like, the Spaniards being a bigger um, country in that time for uh, exploration, this is you know they're getting their their history whitewashed basically to make them look better than they did, and they're getting you know uh, a big plug in the United States. Which is surprising because we kind of stuck with the our our British history as one of the main scoring points there. But I, there's nothing to celebrate at all about what he did. He wasn't the first, and he didn't treat people well. Like I don't there there's like the General E. Lee thing. At least that was an American who was. I mean, he wasn't absolutely a horrible person. He was just surprisingly. Um, didn't change sides because apparently he didn't super like the idea of slavery either. But regardless, there was there's something there about American history that I can understand people wanted to talk about. There's nothing that Christopher Columbus offers American history in my eyes. Exactly. So there's a website you found called Indian Country Today, right? And they have several different things about why yeah. we should be changing Columbus Day did Indigenous People Day and why we should stop celebrating a mass murder. So here's here's the first reason. Columbus's men were rapists and murderers. <laughs> Columbus enslaved the native people for gold. Columbus provided yeah. native sex slaves to his men. Columbus's yeah. men used native people as dog food. They, <laughs> like, when I read that, I was like, no way. That's insane. Yeah. One of the other accounts they had in there was um, several accounts of cruelty and murder include Spaniards testing the sharpness of blades on native people by cutting them in half and beheading them in contests. Like, okay, that's it right there. Like, yeah. I'm not even interested in this guy's history yeah. or any of the people that were with him. I mean, that's that's worse than anything. <laughs> Just, Another, exactly. Ugh. Another reason. Christopher Columbus returned to Spain in shackles. Good. But was pardoned. So again, we have him going back and the society that we lived in saying, well, we don't feel them as humans, therefore, exactly, right? Yeah. So they don't view Indians as humans, Native Americans as humans. They, they didn't look at it like that. It was a horrible They're, time. They, they were enslaving black people and bringing them to America, too. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. the first thing. And so we could sit here all day long, right? And we could Just sit here and we could list. debate. We can talk about the atrocities. We could talk about what we should be doing. But to me, it seems pretty simple. If you have a leader, somebody that has been preached at you for the last hundred years of the Savior, the, the Jesus, the Messiah of, of America, everything that we read now tells us, not, 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 no, we were wrong. We should just admit it. Let's admit we're wrong, and let's move past this. And let's celebrate what's left of the diversity that we tried to squash. <laughs> so what does Donald Trump do? He doubles down. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like one of his cheap casinos, he doubles down on some nasty orange chips and just makes it look worse. I mean, he just, oh, man, I don't know. I, that, that's... This is this is re we're basically re re going over rehashing some of the arguments, but it's it's important to talk about some of the horrible things. And there are some accounts in that um, that link that I I gave you um, the uh, Indian Country Media Network, which it surprised me that they even use Indian because it's like the Louis C.K. joke. It's like they came into the Caribbean into the, to, into the Americas and they were like, "You guys are Indians, right?" And they're like, "Uh, no." No, you're you're Indians, right? Like this is India? Uh, no, no, it's not. It's like, ha ha, you're Indians, and you are forever. Uh, we, they still call them that. Like I personally do not call natives Indians. I, I I managed to push that completely out of my my lexicon. One because like you were saying that your your family is removed pretty far from um, Native American. My father's grandfather was full blooded Choctaw out of uh, Louisiana or Mississippi. Yeah. I cannot remember, but like, so like, I'm not that far out of it, but still, like, unless you're living on a reservation as a native, then you you don't get, really get to claim it anywhere in the United States. So, even that, but still, it, it, you're a Native American, and the people, I believe that's the way they prefer it. So that's what I usually say. So I feel as we close the segment out, one of the things that will hopefully help everybody, right, is I don't know what else to do as an ally. I, I know that I would vote to change Columbus Day. I don't support it. I don't have Columbus Day things. Unlike Randy in South Park, I don't have 
the you know the outfits of Columbus. I never dress as Columbus. I never embrace it. Actually, it's kind of funny because you know about four years ago, my my uncle used to call me Christopher Columbus because my first name's Christopher, obviously, and he thought it was funny. And you I know, finally, I you got Christopher. I'm well, I got Christopher Columbus. I finally just said, hey, you know that's really offensive, and he's like, well, why? And I was like, it's offensive because Christopher Columbus is an offensive person. I was like, you're from Nigeria. Don't you, like, don't you understand that, like, the, maybe he didn't enslave you, but, you know, his ancestors brought you over to be enslaved. You know, like, your people were enslaved. And I just said, he's an awful person. And I said, you know, while I understand that it's a funny joke, to me at this point, it's no longer funny. And so I thought the best thing to do to end the segment was to actually listen to other Native Americans describe how they feel about Columbus Day. Ooh. Christopher Columbus. Ugh. Evil. Pure evil. Invader. He got lost coming here, and he's the one that named us Indians because he thought he was in India. So he's, he's not a good figure to the Native community. Confused? <laughs> I don't think we should have a holiday for it. <laughs> Pain, claiming North America is, is like land that could be claimed and could be taken. It's the start of a lot of pain. Christopher Columbus. Mm. Uh, I guess ignorance. Oh my god, murder, rapist. Genocide. The atrocities committed, just grotesque. Um, and the scars are still felt today. Evil. Evil. Ah, uh, fuck him. Yeah. yeah, fuck Columbus. Fuck Christopher Columbus. That's a big fuck you. He's the first terrorist in America, that's for sure. It's according to the U.S. government law, it says if you partake in somebody that's stealing, then you're just as guilty. Everybody knows the United States was stolen. So therefore, all those that are orig- original, that knows about the genocide, the rape, the murder, the theft, the putting on the reservations on a rock that they couldn't survive on, they're going to have to face judgment. Murderer, um, rapist. It always was weird to me to have that day off in celebration of somebody. Like, you, we don't have a day for Hitler, but it's, you know, it's the same thing. Like, like there, there are so many other people that Italian Americans or Italians can hold up as their heroes besides Columbus. Brawl. <laughs> Fake. Fake. They teach us that Christopher Columbus discovered America. What should they teach? That Christopher Columbus didn't discover anything and instead got lost. Looking for something new and exciting, or maybe just a change from the old atheist show format? Cellar Door Skeptics Podcast provides listeners with hours of enjoyment each week on Spreaker and iTunes. Check us out as we talk politics, religion, science, reviews, books, and music, along with the occasional interview just for a twist. Join Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they bring fresh content to you. Walk with us through the cellar door as we help you prepare for the revolution. You can find us on Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, and even on Facebook. Hey, my name is Jeremiah. And this is David. From the God Theory Podcast. And you're listening to Cellar Door Skeptics. Prepare for the revolution. And now, back to Cellar Door Skeptics with your hosts, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. The show with the sources. And now. Off the Deep End with Chris Hanna. Welcome to the very first Off the Deep End. This will be a regular deep dive type segment. 
is going to be episodic and I will let you know how many sections each topic will have. The first topic is going to be CRISPR. This first segment will be what is it and how does it work. The second will be what have we done with it so far. And the third will be what can we do with it in the future, including the barriers and dangers of this new technology. Each segment will start off with some terms and definitions as needed with more prepared throughout. And so without further ado, let us dive into the first topic, the first segment of CRISPR. Every cell in our body contains a copy of our genome, over 20,000 genes, 3 billion letters of DNA. So the first couple terms for this segment are going to be base, as in genetics, a shortened version of the term nucleobase. These bases are building blocks of DNA and RNA molecules. DNA, short for deoxyribonucleic acid, a long, double-stranded, spiral-shaped molecule inside most living cells that carries genetic instructions. It is built on a backbone of phosphorus, oxygen, and carbon atoms. In all living things, from plants to animals to microbes, these instructions tell cells which molecules to make. DNA consists of two strands twisted into a double helix and held together by a simple pairing rule. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. DNA pairing letters A, C, G, and T, representing the four nucleotide bases of a DNA strand, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Our genes shape who we are as individuals and as a species. Genes also have profound effects on health, and thanks to advances in DNA sequencing, researchers have identified thousands of genes that affect our risk of disease. Gene, adjective genetic, a segment of DNA that codes or holds instructions for producing a protein. Offspring inherit genes from their parents. Genes influence how an organism looks and behaves. To understand how genes work, researchers need ways to control them. Changing genes in living cells is not easy. But recently, a new method has been developed that promises to dramatically improve our ability to edit the DNA of any species, including humans. CRISPR, an abbreviation pronounced CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspace Short Palindromic Repeats. The CRISPR method is based on a natural system used by bacteria to protect themselves from infection by viruses. CRISPR is a naturally occurring ancient defense mechanism found in a wide range of bacteria. In the 1980s, scientists observed a strange pattern in some bacterial genomes. One DNA sequence would be repeated over and over again, with unique sequences in between the repeats. They called this odd configuration clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, or CRISPR. CRISPR is one part of the bacteria's immune system, which keeps bits of dangerous viruses around so it can recognize and defend against those viruses the next time they attack. When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA. RNA, a molecule that helps read the genetic information contained in DNA. A cell's molecular machinery reads DNA to create RNA, and then reads RNA to create proteins. One of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 an enzyme that geneticists are now using to help edit genes. It can cut through DNA, allowing it to fix broken genes, splice into new ones, or disable certain genes. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. Cas, CRISPR-associated proteins. Just uses the first few letters of both those words. <laughs> These can precisely snip DNA and slice the hell out of any invading viruses. Conveniently, the genes that encode for Cas are always sitting somewhere near the CRISPR sequences. When the matching sequence, known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. Genome, the complete set of genes or genetic material in the cell or an organism. The study of this genetic inheritance housed within the cell is known as genomics. Over the past few years, researchers studying the system realized that it could be engineered to cut not just viral DNA, but any DNA sequence at a precisely chosen location by changing the guide RNA to match the target. And this can be done not just in a test tube, but also within the nucleus of a living cell. There are a number of Cas enzymes, but the best known is called Cas9. It comes from Streptococcus pyogenes, better known as the bacteria that causes strep throat. Together, they form CRISPR-Cas9 system. 
Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the PAN. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. DNA is a very long string of four different bases, A, T, C, and G. Other enzymes used in molecular biology might make a cut every time they see, say, a T, C, G, A sequence going wild and dicing up the entire genome. The CRISPR-Cas9 system doesn't do that. Cas9 can recognize a sequence about 20 bases long, so it can be better tailored to a specific gene. All you have to do is design the target sequence using an online tool. This is used to order the guide RNA that you will use to match. It takes no longer than a few days for the guide sequence to arrive by mail. You can even repair a faulty gene by cutting it with CRISPR and injecting a normal copy into the cell. Occasionally, though, the enzyme still cuts in the wrong place, which is one of the stumbling blocks for wider use, especially in the clinic. Some cases have an efficiency of approximately 50%, while better cases are approximately 80%. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut but the repair process is error-prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. Mutation, verb mutate, some change that occurs to a gene in an organism's DNA. Some mutations occur naturally. Others can be triggered by outside factors such as pollution, radiation, medicine, or something in the diet. A gene with this change is referred to as a mutant. These mutations are random, but sometimes researchers need to be more precise, for example by replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy. This can be done by adding another piece of DNA that carries the desired sequence. Once the CRISPR system has made a cut, this DNA template can pair up with the cut ends, recombining and replacing the original sequence with the new version. Mice, whose genes have been altered or knocked out, also known as disabled, are the workhorses for biomedical research. It could take over a year to establish new lines of genetically altered mice with traditional techniques. It takes at least three generations of mice to get your experimental mutant for research. It takes just a few months with CRISPR-Cas9, sparing the lives of many mice and saving much time. Researchers inject the CRISPR-Cas9 sequences into mouse embryos. The system edits both copies of a gene at the same time, and you get the mouse in one generation. The CRISPR-Cas9, you can also alter, say, five genes at once, where you would have to go into this laborious, multi-generational process five times before. All this can be done in cultured cells, including stem cells, that can give rise to many different cell types. It can also be done in a fertilized egg, allowing the creation of transgenic animals with targeted mutations. Closer to reality are other genetically modified creatures, and not just ones in the labs. CRISPR could become a major force in ecology and conservation, especially when paired with other molecular biology tools. It could, for example, be used to introduce genes that slowly kill off the mosquitoes spreading malaria, or genes that put the brakes on invasive species like weeds. It could be the next great leap in conserving or enhancing our environment, opening up a whole new box of risks and rewards. And unlike previous methods, CRISPR can be used to target many genes at once, a big advantage for studying complex human diseases that are caused not by a single mutation, but by many genes acting together. These methods are being improved rapidly and will have many applications in basic research, in drug development, in agriculture, and perhaps eventually for treating human patients with genetic disease. And that is what we will be talking about next time. Until then, don't be afraid of those dark waters. We have a few lights for you. This has been another Off the Deep End. Now back to Cellar Door Skeptics. If you guys like what you're hearing on Cellar Door Skeptic, please consider sponsoring us on our Patreon page. Our goal at Cellar Door Skeptic is to help promote more science, skepticism, secularism, and humanism in the world. We want to create better content for our podcast and for you, the listener, all while trying to help promote local activism. We're going to strive to make better podcasts, and I'll tell you what, we're even going to contribute some of the proceeds to charity. 
So please join us over at Patreon forward slash Cellar Door Skeptics to make sure that you sponsor us for as little as a dollar an episode. Thank you guys so much and prepare for the revolution. Hey, this is Keith. And this is Jen, and we're from Not Another Atheist Podcast. You're listening to Cellar Door Skeptics. Join the revolution. The conversation started last week with my six year old daughter. Lately, with the amount of work I have been doing, dinner time is becoming hard to make but increasingly necessary if I want to spend some time talking with my children. Dinner time is a time that we eat, we talk about our day, our work, and we we get to know each other a little bit better for that 30 to 40 minutes that we sit down together. I cherish dinner time because it allows me to continue to see growth in my children while helping them navigate the perils of society and friendship. Usually the conversation's not overly deep as I try to avoid politics or religion unless it comes up naturally from school. For example, the other day, um, it was right around Columbus Day time, the children learned that Christopher Columbus was not the person who founded America. They also learned that he was not the best person ever. This was driven through a discussion in my third grade daughter's class that they had the same day Columbus Day happened to be. They brought it home, we talked about it, and it was kind of allowing us to work through the different things that they learned. It is interesting what we talk about on some of these nights. But the idea for this segment and the inspiration for some of the other segments that I'll be doing like this in the near future is the conversation my first grader had with me. While we're eating, she casually happened to ask if I believe in God. Now, for those of you who listen to the show you know, either for a while now or who have been with us since the beginning, understand that I went through a very uh, vocal phase of atheism. My children are not strangers to this, and and they don't miss the glaring fact that they do not have to shower on Saturday nights, and they do not have to get up early for church on Sundays. They also aren't blind to the fact that kids walk home from church during the summer every Sunday at the exact same time, and they also see their ultra-religious friend invite them to every single event that their church has. In the past, we have had many discussions about God and religion, so this inquiry about whether I believe in a God is not really that shocking. In an effort to keep the peace at home, I try not to influence or provide opinions all the time to the younger children. Part of this is kind of driven through my wife, whom is also an atheist, but is a lot more passive in her non-belief. The other part is myself wanting to try and allow them to have their own thoughts and not indoctrinate them into a non-belief. I want them to be able to come into their own understanding without it being forced or coaxed. Allowing for the maximum amount of freedom can be very taxing on me, though especially when their community, relatives, and friends all believe and participate in religion. But this conversation struck me as something worthwhile to share, something that I I feel is illustrated through a child's perspective who has her own beliefs but allows for a challenge to people like me and those around her. So here's the conversation. Daughter. Dad, do you believe in God? Me. Well, daughter, why do you ask? I just wanted to know. Does it does it matter if I do or not? Well, the neighborhood friend said that we should all believe in God, but you do not go to church. I used to go to church when I was a lot younger, about your age. Well, you do not go now. Well, if we must be honest then, I do not see evidence for God to exist. But if you or others do... You're more welcome to this belief. Hmm. 
thought so. What brought this on tonight, honey? I was just wondering. I love you always, Dad. Do you believe in God, daughter? Yes, well, maybe. I don't know. Neighborhood friends said I should. But I just want all of us to be happy. That is a good goal to have, daughter. I hope you always strive for that. Love you and always will, no matter what you believe. Love you too. Please pass the ketchup for my grilled cheese because it needs to taste good. This very conversation, as brief as it was, left a big impression on me. Maybe in the past I've had to have this conversation before. Maybe not. I kind of don't remember. (laughs) The important part was that it helped me relate to my daughter without having to enforce a dogmatic belief. But what really was very interesting to me is how many secular parents actually have to deal with this. What also hit me is the other conversation that I have to have like the one about us burning in hell because we don't go to church, or the conversation about who goes into heaven and how come you can't come too, Dad, and why don't you just believe this so that we can live forever happy and happy and happy? Or even the conversation that they kind of bring up about how they need to convince me because it's the most important thing they believe and it's detrimental that they actually get me to believe with them. These kind of thoughts actually trigger my anxiety. They leave me very panicky. You know, it's because I worry a lot about losing my children to a belief set that restricts them from seeing me. I know. I understand. That's not all religion. I get that. I'm not saying it is. I am saying that I did grow up with a family that did originally believe that. Now, with me being out as an atheist for the last four or five years, my immediate family has not disowned me. They have accepted it, allowed for me to live my life, and continued in their original tradition. But seeing how religion can restrict family relationships, I know it because I left religion and I lost some family members for being openly atheists. I worried about the loss of my family, about losing the ones I grew up with, the people I leaned on, the people I hung out with for 30 or plus years of my life. So these are questions that bring fear to my heart and give me pause about the amount of interaction my kids have with religion at a young age. The fear of losing my precious daughters to fear and illogical beliefs because I cannot do exactly what they want or be who they want or believe what they want is a very overwhelming presence. This is not something I take lightly, and it's, it's very hard for me to express sometimes how I feel to others. But what I realize here and, and why I felt this conversation was so important is because these worried thoughts, these images, these videos that play in my head are nothing more than anxiety manifesting itself the way the v- a virus would when it tried to destroy its host. It's somewhat natural. It's somewhat ingrained from a fear-based society. It's somewhat ingrained from a fear-based religion I grew up with. My worry is something that's natural, though. It should be dealt with, and, it sh- and we shouldn't hold on to some of these false constraints about whether or not I'll get into heaven. The opposite is true, right? The opposite is true. It's not that I worry about getting into heaven or my kids getting into heaven. It's that I worry about religion separating me from my children. The opposite, right? That's the opposite of it. It's it's a fear that is based in what I know religion can do to individuals rather than a superficial belief that some supreme being is going to torture, torture me or separate me from those I love. But these fears are real. These fears are fears lots of secular parents feel. These are fears that a lot of children feel when they leave religion. But these fears are ones that we must face in an effort to not isolate our children while allowing them to be able to understand the world through their own eyes and not our eyes. There's a book I read recently by Wendy Thomas, and the name of the book is called Relax, It's Just God, How and Why to Talk to Your Kids About Religion When You're Not Religious. And 
on this recent, well, it's not recent, but on this 2015 interview uh, by PBS called The News Hour Bookshelf, she said this very important thing. Religion isn't going anywhere. Religion is going to be around for a long time. But it's true that secularism is on the rise, and it's rapidly growing. And it's grown in the last 20 years. The problem with a lot of parents in this particular group is that they are trying to raise their kids in this era of transition or this era of change. So let's come up with a way that we could talk to our kids about religion that's completely honest, that values critical thinking, that values religious tolerance and literacy, and that kind that leaves the door open for kids to really make up their own minds. That sentiment is great. That's the kind of sentiment that I want to embrace. I want to be able to engage with my kids this way because I don't want my kids to become rigid, to not use critical thinking, to grow up thinking they have to be atheists or secularists to appease me. I want them to believe whatever they want, but for good reasons. And I feel that addressing our fears of losing our children, of allowing them to kind of walk outside of the bounds of our protection area it's natural it's something all parents feel the difference is is that a lot of times people don't fear their children walking away forever based on on a practice or a belief set that they just think is completely illogical and that's a true fear but i kind of think that we're now at the point where it is almost reverse from what it was, you know, for us growing up. For me, my parents feared, you know, me leaving religion and not being saved. Then they came to the conclusion that I can believe what I want because none of us know what's going to happen when we die. And that's the best thing about this is I'm now experiencing things my parents probably felt back then. The difference is, is instead of hiding behind it and telling my kids, you can't do this or you're not going to do this or I can't have you going to that study if you, you know, because I'm worried that you're going to learn some gobbledygook. I can now say, hey, if that's what you truly want, I support you and I can allow for that. And I sometimes think that there is a religious trauma that comes around from indoctrination. And maybe some of us are more susceptible than others. But I do feel that there's some of that there because my anxiety and my fear of losing my kids isn't anything new to being a parent. But it is based in the fact that I understand how religion operates and how religion separates families and ruins lives in some way, shape, or form all the time. But I feel this is something that we should all embrace And that I'm really hoping that everybody will embrace that sentiment of being open and engaging their children for the years to come as they're going to have to navigate their life with non-religious parents. If you're looking for more resources, I've included a few links to books I recommend reading. If you're non-religious or have children that may be looking to be non-religious as well. There's a blog I also included from Hemet Meta that has plenty of different resources that you can use as secularists. And it's got a lot of links to different books that are recommended as well. Lastly, I included a link to a secular atheist parent Reddit thread, which I felt was worth worth mentioning for those that like to engage on Reddit. And it is a somewhat active thread, so it's not like you're going to be reading stuff from two years ago. You're going to be reading stuff that is current, and you can engage other fellow atheist parents along with you. Well, so give me the example of the most basic question of your child says, Mommy, does God exist? And what is God? Or who is God? The way that I go about it is to say, that's a great question, and I'm glad you're thinking about it. Um, that there are a lot of different ways that people describe God and, and describe what God is, and this is what some people believe, and this is what other people believe, and this is, and I, I don't believe in God, but that's okay, it's all okay, and you get to make up your own mind about what to believe. Isn't that kind of mushy? Isn't it the job of a parent to, to gu- I'll use the word guide again, their, their child to say, Well, no, it's not just this, it could be this, it could be that, whatever you think, whatever goes. 
Right. Well, I think within reason, and I do. I see a、uh, difference between.、Um, Guiding your child to be a moral person, an ethical person, a self-respecting person,、um, a critical thinker—those are all really important things. Guiding them to believe in a certain way, in a certain God or or a certain prophet—that is not so important. I really want to focus on what people do in life and not what they believe, because if we can judge people on their actions and not what. We think the reasons behind their actions are. It makes、uh, it makes for a more tolerant world and a better world. Like what you're hearing? Check out more Cellar Door Skeptics every week right here on Spreaker and iTunes. Make sure you come back and check out new episodes with your hosts Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. And always remember, prepare for the revolution. This is Deborah McTaggart, the voice of Beatrice Johnson from Atheist Apocalypse Podcast, and you are listening to Cellar Door Skip. And as we return for the final segment, the rebirth of Cellar Door Skeptics, we we wanted to talk about a very important topic tonight, and and not that anything we talked about earlier wasn't important, but the chip program is something that has kind of infused itself into the hearts and minds of those listening to Cellar Door Skeptics as well as those hosting Cellar Door Skeptics. Our goal with this is to kind of talk about what children's health insurance program, what will happen to it in the future, and how the Republicans and Donald Trump seem to just not want to give children health insurance, and that seems、yeah. crazy, right? I mean, Hannah, you, I, how how can how is this possible? Why, how how can any human being go? Yeah, we don't want to give children health insurance because their parents are too afford are too poor to afford health care. That's one of the issues I don't understand. So, like the you know the pro life party, right? The take care of of the middle class party, the 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 party of the of the 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 working American just doesn't seem to understand that a lot of these middle class working Americans that can't afford their own health care, they at least will try to get coverage for their children. You know, I mean the kids the kids will get their coverage. They'll sacrifice their own health to help pay their kids or whatever. And That's what this program is. In 1993, the Clinton administration could not get a health care reform passed. They just couldn't do it. And、uh, but in '97, with、um, Edward Kennedy and、uh, Orrin Hatch, with Hillary Clinton, this was one of Hillary Clinton's crowning achievements in politics. They created the S chip program, and it's one of the、uh, the largest expansion of taxpayer funded health insurance coverage for children in the U.S. since LBJ established Medicaid in 1965. This is a huge deal. This is established for、um, for the chips, or for chip was、uh, under Title IX for the Social Security Act. But you would think that people would be able to at least do this. I mean, help, pay for the kids. Yeah, <laughs> where's, and, and, where's where's the, where's the humanity?、There? Right? Where's the humanity? Where's the <laughs> how do we how do we support children? And and you know that's the the thing here. And the reason we wanted to make this kind of the main segment here is not only because this affects our kids' lives, not only because this is something that We have friends that are going through this, but what happens when they repeal this? This is one of the、um, additions to the Obamacare or the ACA that kind of came out. I think it was what last year, the year before, when the expansion happened. And so, when the expansion got released, the chip program got extra funding. It allowed for more people to put their children and themselves under low income, actually, to get、um, health insurance instead of just saying, "Hey, you know what." You're gonna have to pay the medical bills, and it's kind of funny, you know. Back a year and a half ago, I didn't have health insurance. When I took my new job, I guess it was two and a half years ago. When I took my new job, I didn't have health insurance. I continued to use the Obamacare health insurance because I didn't know how long my job was gonna last, and it was one of those things. Well, after about a year, I was able to apply for health insurance. Well, right before I was able to go into my reup program, where it allowed me to actually apply for it for the year, I ended up having、um, a panic attack, which at the time I thought was a heart attack. 
And I had to call the ambulance, got sent to the hospital, had a whole bunch of checks ran on me. And long story short, it was a $2,000 bill. Now, can you yeah. imagine if this is your child, right? You, you're not going to contemplate, well, this is what it's going to cost me. You're going to take your no. child to the emergency room. You're going to take your child to the hospital. You're going you're gonna to do what it takes to keep your child alive. But can you imagine having to deal with the bills, the costs afterwards? How do we help ex- figure out this, right? Because if you work at McDonald's full time and you don't get health insurance because you can't afford it, and then you have to take a second job just to help pay for the car payment, you know, or help pay for the groceries because McDonald's doesn't pay you enough as a living wage. <laughs> what do you do for insurance? What do you do for your kids for insurance? And so the whole point of this is to be able to allow for children and allow for states to submit for extra funding for the federal government to allow for these people to have decent insurance that allows for their kids to be taken care of when emergencies arise or even common illnesses arise. Yeah, so, and um, well, it just real quick did um, in '97 when this was all started, and it was more than a couple years ago. Obama um, signed Chipra, so you'll hear us say Chip and Chipra throughout this program. Or the, Can we this say segment. it like this. So we got to say it like this. We got to say Chipra. That's how you got to say it, <laughs> Hannah. Every time I, you I say it, you got to say Chipra. It's it's too close to a Stargate moment <laughs> when we're talking about the gods and uh, the Egyptian <laughs> tri pyramids or whatever. Anyways, in 2009, President Obama signed what was a chip. Children's uh, Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act. So you'll hear us say CHIP and CHIPRA, and that was what you were mentioning too a few minutes ago for um, what Obama basically re-upped the uh, entire program. And so this isn't essentially getting repealed, though. It's basically they just didn't sign it for like, hey, we're going to refund this. We're going to make sure this continues to have the money that it needs. So essentially what they've done is said, we're not going to kill it. We're not going to repeal it. We're just not going to put any money into it. We're, we're gonna we 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 let the uh, uh, expiration date pass and just didn't pull the trigger, and so what the the reason why this is a big deal is because what this means is that all of the federal money going back into these programs simply isn't just gonna, isn't going to go there, and so uh, I believe it's the state of Nevada, they could be out of their money by the end of November early December. Some of the other states uh, in New England or whatever they think they might be able to survive until May April, uh, but when that runs out. All of the kids that are covered are just off. They just don't have the coverage anymore. So b- basically the state is being asked to reassume all of the money that's coming in from the federal government that is no longer coming in. And so, the, all, I mean, everybody's state's budgets are strapped and stretched and being pushed and pulled, uh, except for the marijuana states. They've got lots of extra tax money, but <laughs> it's a different conversation. Uh, but really, I mean, this is just this is this is a danger to children by the inaction of the government, basically, they ignored um, an expiration date that they should have come through with, and that's that's really what this is. And, and some of me wonders if if they ignored it on purpose, Hannah. I mean, some oh, of me wonders that, right? You know, let's how about this? Let's go back to 2009 when Obama first signed this. He says this. He says today, with one of the first bills I signed, reauthoring reauthorizing the CHIP program, we fulfill one of the highest responsibilities we have to ensure the health and well-being of our nation's children. It is a responsibility that has only grown more urgent as our economic crisis has deepened. Healthcare costs increase and exploded, and millions of working families unable to afford health insurance. Today in America, 8 million children are still underinsured, and more than 45 million Americans are uninsured altogether. Yeah, that's before they were get the, able to get the Affordable Care Act moving and all that kind of stuff. Like they at least they couldn't they couldn't get the Affordable Care Act figured out at that point. They didn't have it. So what did they do? They just took care of the kids to start. I mean, that's what you do. And then we let we'll take care of the kids, make sure the kids are okay, and then the rest of the adults are done bickering. We can figure out what we're going to do for each other. But I mean, these the, the children can't go out and get a job and figure out something on their own. They're completely and utterly dependent on their caretakers, adults, guardians, or whoever. I mean, this this is something that they can't fix. Yeah, I mean, and, without, and, and, without and, and, question, they yeah, should be taken care of. Exactly. And Obama said, you know, he he had this story from this gentleman named Gregory from Martinsville, Virginia, who lost his job in August, and his kids lost all their health care. When he broke the news to his family, his nine year old son handed his piggy bank over with $4 in it and said, Daddy, if you need it, you can have this. 
And Obama goes on to say this. He says, this is not who we are. We're not a nation that leaves struggling families to fend for themselves. No child in America should be receiving her primary health care in the emergency room in the middle of the night. No child should be falling behind at school because he cannot hear the teachers or see the blackboard. That's that's empowering. We're not seeing that from this current administration. And and you know, that actually touches on my life. When I lost my job two or three years ago, right? We lost our health care insurance. We didn't have health care insurance. And, you know, when your daughter gets sick with a cold, the first thing you think of is if I go to the emergency room, what is it going to cost me? And that should that should never be a thought on a parent's mind. (laughs) Nobody should ever have to actually contemplate, hey, if I go here, how long do I have to pay the bill? And can they sue me for this? Right. Yeah. That should never happen. It creates a downward spiral. So one of the things I like to remind people when they're talking about Medicare and Medicaid, because this will be relevant in a second, it's silver hair, Medicare, underpaid, (laughs) Medicaid. There you go. I mean, it it really is. It's a really nice, easy way to remember. So like whenever you see Medicare, it's for the elderly. And whenever you see Medicaid, it's going to be underpaid, which could also be the elderly. But the Medicaid expansion. So we always hear about the Medicaid expansion. The Social Security Act was part of that. Um, CHIP specifically is a program under which a state receives federal funding to provide child 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 health care assistance to uninsured low income children that meets the requirements of the section 2103 of the Social Security Act and then um, the exp- Medicaid expansion portion of CHIP is a program under which state receives federal funding to expand Medicaid eligibility to optional targeted low-income children that meets the requirements of the same Social Security Act. And then there's the combination CHIP is the program under which state receives funding to implement both a Medicaid expansion and a separate CHIP. So there's different levels and different ways, and the states have a little bit of a choice in what way and what, um, I guess, what um, – what manner they wish to allocate everything. So there's a couple different levels that these people have. They either use the Medicaid expansion, they create their own separate child health care insurance program, or they mix the two state two together. And each state has a different um, bit of information. And so this is something that you can look up to to see what your state has and maybe get involved with your senator or something and say, listen, I really want to, really want you to try to go ahead and talk to the administration or Congress and see if we can't get this refunded. Because, like I said, some of the states haven't lost it yet. You may be in a state, if, if you're listening, that still has it. And you may be, even be eligible to get something before everything runs out. And so take a look into that because the states are given a, a decent amount of leeway in this. And then, obviously, that'll, that'll bring back you know, all these stories about whether, whether or not you know, you're in the di- downward spiral like where we were a second ago. Is that when it comes to health care, it's been proven that it is cheaper for health care and for the, the health of the nation, if you don't do your primary health care in the insurance or in the emergency room, if you have if you have access to preventative care and regular care, you you will have a healthier life and the emergencies won't happen as much. And the emergencies are significantly more expensive and usually a lot more detrimental. You can lose jobs, you can lose whatever. And so like it costs less to have decent health care. And regular checkups. I, I, this is another issue where I, the economists and people that are advising the government as far as the Republican supermajority, it always boggles my mind that they don't look at the actual numbers because this isn't something that, like it's an opinion-based thing. You can see that it costs less if people get a, the health care. And so I, I, what I'll do is I'll see if I can find a link to this to give a good, um, good explanation for some people. But – I don't know, man. And I agree with you. And one of the big points here, you know, a lot of people are like, well, isn't this going to create a huge cost burden for the government? And we could actually talk about that because we're we're going to get into that in a second. But if you actually go through the chip reports and the enrollment reports, there's less than 3% increase every year. So it's not like there is a huge, hey, 20, 40, 50% increase in, you know, people joining in. Even the first year. There isn't this large increase of people joining this program. We're seeing literally less than a 3% increase a year. Now, I'm not going to say a 3% increase a year is good, right? I'm not going to sit there and say that doesn't cost money. But I am going to say that it's not this overwhelming burden. We're not seeing like 40% of the nation all of a sudden joining up for this chip program. That's yeah. not what's happening. And, and, and that's the main point you know. here is everybody is very worried about What's going to happen to our finances as a federal government? What's going to happen if we do institute universal health care? Where is the cost going to come from? Who's going to pay for it? But we can see here just with this CHIP program, we're seeing less than 3% a year increase 
over the previous year of people joining into the program. And so that's 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 actually a pretty, in my opinion, that's a pretty big marker because mm-hmm. if it was running rampant, right, and people were abusing the system, you would see spikes and decreases all over the board. There isn't that. You're literally within a 1% tolerance. You know, one year it's 1.6, the next year it's 2.4, the next year it's 1.8, and the year after that it was 2.6. So, you know, there isn't a large abuse happening by any way, shape, or form, whether it's because of regulation or because people don't need it as much as what others feel that it happens. As, especially when it comes to, um, like, what are the things that people are getting covered? So, I mean, basically get right back into um, the, the program itself is some of the benchmarks that they're trying to hit. So, like, they're, they're, they're not just trying to, you know, and just give everyone or all the children this way overstated health care. They're just trying to get them on a healthy program to the point where they're able to move on in society. And if you, I mean, if you get a chance to have uh, decent health care and you can, you can grow up and just concentrate on school and become a working member of society, that's the whole goal. And then we can bicker and talk about the adults again, like I was saying before. Um, some of these uh, benchmarks, are just they will get coverage from the standard Blue Cross Blue Shield provider. Is what the, this uh, what they'll get that's uh, offered to uh, federal employees, or they can get the states in, state employees uh, coverage plan, or the um, HMO that has the largest commercial non Medicaid enrollment in that state. So these are the, these are basically the benchmarks requiring. Um, they has to have one of those three things or something along those lines, and um, for uh, benchmark equivalent coverage must be um, equivalent. Uh, to inpatient and outpatient hospital services. So they must at least get emergency room care. And then they have access to physician services, surgical and medical services, lab and x-ray services, and then well baby and well child care, uh, including all of the immunizations. So we're talking the bare necessities. So like if you bought the bronze plan in the ACA markets, you're, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get just, just to keep these kids seeing a doctor. They'll be able to cover a few labs and x-rays and necessary things, and they'll get basic surgical and medical services. And then a physician just, you know, uh, your standard – the, the standard benefits. And then there's some dental benefits um, to help, you know, teeth make a big difference in quality of life and lo- length of life. The vaccines, I mean, there's no question there. That's, that's a requirement. Most states are going full bore into. But the cost sharing is the area where a lot of people have these really big battles. So the states can choose to impose limited enrollment fees, premiums, deductibles, um, co-insurance, co-payments for children, pregnant women with uh, that are enrolled in the CHIP, so the, the, the child care and child welfare, or the infant care. Um, this is generally limited to 5% of a family's annual income. But cost sharing is prohibited um, for some services like well baby and well child visits. So uh, just updates, whatever. But it's limited to 5% of your income. And that's, that's a pretty big deal because if you think about it, like we always talk about the idea of like the flat rate tax um, for American people or something like that. Like if I paid you know, something like 36% or something of my total income. Uh, but if you take healthcare in the total of that, you know, I, I bet you I'm paying like 11% of my yearly income in just in my healthcare costs. And these people have even less money than I do when it comes to, you know, the minimum wage and everything. And so if they're paying for, a, uh, an apartment or something, that 5% could be the difference between them being able to eat that day. You know what I mean? And so like this, this is limiting it so that it doesn't take such a big slice out of that out of their income and they can afford to have a nicer car. They can have a working car. Maybe they could eat some better food, just be healthier. And so the cost sharing is the federal government is covering um, the extra money past that 5%. Exactly. And the Washington Post has a great article where they talk about this. They talk about how CHIP covers more than 8 million children since its implementation. But the percentage of uninsured children in this country has fallen from 14% to 5%. That's a lot. That's huge. Yeah, four and a half. Four, four and a half. Four and a half percent. Take another half percent off there, buddy boy. <laughs> All right. Well, fine. Whatever. And <laughs> that matters when it's millions, man. In, in, children enrolled in CHIP have improved access, like we talked about, to the health care, the dental coverage, and anything that will help them live. So think about it this way: today, CHIP and Medicaid provide health insurance coverage to thirty-nine percent of the nation's children. Now, yeah. If we were in business, right, if we owned our own business, the first thing I would do is say, okay, 
let's look at that 39% and create a Pareto chart and find out what is the largest common denominator for the majority of these children. My guess it would be wages. And then after that, it would probably be um, race. the <laughs> race. Yep. Yeah. And then after that, it would be education. So I'm going to say that those are the three top ones that we would focus on. And if we were a business that we're actually turning around and saying, okay, how do we affect these things? How do we change? How do we create legislation that could affect these different things? We would look at those things. Now, in my personal opinion, the federal government does not op- operate that way. <laughs> you know, personally, I don't think they do that. But that's if, if we were a true, a true state or a true country, I guess I should say, that valued big business, we would look at those different things and try and figure out how we can affect them. Because even if I can change, even if I have to spend a little bit more money, if my bottom line goes up because of the fact that I'm utilizing the workforce better, whether it's (laughs) through giving them free, you know, vaccines or flu shots or whatever you want, the same thing, but you know, you know what I'm saying? you can actually increase your workforce. And, you know, like my company offers free flu shots. They cover your your flu shot costs. You don't have to pay anything for a flu shot. So that's why, you know, again, I would say instead of defunding the CHIP program, we actually looked at those different things and said, hey, how can we improve how people work? How can we improve how people's, you know, lives are? And, and get rid of this, you know, I think health disparity that we've seen. And, you know, and that's what this this article talks about, right? They talk about how yeah. there's different experiences, different things people are having. But throughout the practice, this is only costing us, I think it was, what, $13.6 billion a year to do this. And, yeah, yeah we have a, a trillion, you know, how, many, how much money goes into our war? We could just stop going to war and probably fund this and, and call it a day and have extra money. But... You know, think about if, if a child loses a parent, if a parent passes away. Think about it if a child gets really sick. What does that cost us? Does anybody actually think about the long-term cost of this? All we're worried about is what is it going to cost out of our tax pocket? How much more money are we going to have to pay? And why should we have to pay for somebody else? And, 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 and the, the, the incredulous thing here is for those of you who vote that way or who think that way, have you ever stopped to go, Hold on. Where's the humanity value in this? Well, How can you call yourself a humanist? Well, Trump Trump ran on running the government like a business, right? He ran on I'm the most efficient guy. I'm the best at building things. I'm the I'm the most business savvy guy you'll ever meet. I'm the best at making deals. Well, here's a place where you could really really make a deal cuz if you look at what a, a country is, if you run it like a business like you were talking earlier, what's the money? The, the overall – if you if you say that the, the, the total amount of money that the United States has inside of it is the end goal, well, I, like I said earlier, and I, I found an, uh, a, a link to the Kaiser Institute that says that it's, it's more expensive for people to get their health care primarily from the ER. But so that's a, that's a place where we have a cost detriment. And then if you look at, well, is your workforce healthy? Are they enumerated – uh, are encumbered in debt and um, you know terrified to to look at the doctor and are you shortening their the expected lifespans at the lower levels and the poverty levels? Well, that's going to be a detriment to the income of the state there too. So like, capital is also uh, entangled into the people. So if Donald Trump wants to run the country like a business, you want to make everything run as best as it can, as efficiently as can. And the bottom line, like you said earlier, has to go up. Well, this is a place where it can go up. If you benefit the children, you benefit people's health care, your, your capital, the people capital is going to go up. And so th- th- that whole thing is $13.6 billion is what we paid out in 2016. Well, they're, they're cutting the discretionary federal budget by $50 billion so they can take that $50 billion and put it further into the defense, uh, the, the defense fund, which was at – last I checked was at um, $600-something billion. Like, d- would another 50 make a huge difference or was 13.6 enough to keep the kids healthy? 
uh, yeah, maybe healthcare costs are really high, but I'm saying that that extra money doesn't need to go into the defense fund. It can stay in this kind of program, which has been proven to be incredibly successful. The Washington Post gets it great. They talk about some of the things that um, that they do really, really well. Like we, I, I mentioned them earlier, it's just for routine checkups, immunizations, doctor visits, prescriptions, dental and health care, which I didn't know about the dental. I thought that was really cool. But in vision care, I would expect. But inpatient, outpatient, health, health uh, hospital care, then the lab x-ray services and emergency services. So they're, you're guaranteed emergency services, um, but you probably won't have any kind of coverage. And so um, you'll pay the full cost of that. So like you said, do you take your kid there? Yep. There's a, and, and, what you and, can do yeah, you're right. And then the, there's another enhancement too. You know, technically they're talking about how the chip program provides a a larger coverage percentage, if we want to call it. So think about it this way: chip program pays about seventy one percent of the costs, whereas Medicaid only pays fifty six percent of the costs. So there's a huge difference too in what the programs cover. So like we talked yeah. about earlier, it's an extension, right? It's an addition. Yep. It's it's adding to. Medicaid and and it's doing so in a way that allows children to get more health insurance than let's just say their adult counterparts, and that's yeah. that's crazy. And, and so you're right. Should we have some sort of insurance reform? Probably. I mean, I'm yeah. not saying we we shouldn't, but you know, I we, would say we have to stop would... here though, and we have to say okay, before we could create a reform, we have to give people insurance, and then after that, what we need to do is start going after the insurance companies and figuring out how we can correct this problem. I would say, let's okay, what's the problem that we have in the United States? The cost is insanely high compared to the rest of the industrialized world. Why are we attacking who has coverage and who doesn't have coverage? Why are we not attacking the reason why our, our health care is double what other Western uh, European nations pay in some of these things? Like I get the United States – may have better coverage in some cases. I've seen a couple of great things, including a, uh, um, a Daily Show segment when Jon Stewart was still there, when the people who were doing third world emergency health care services were helping in Tennessee because health care in that region was so bad that they needed a uh, an NGO or a, uh, um, a special charitable group that flew doctors in to help with people in a small community that were incredibly sick and not getting coverage. If that's the quality of care in the United States, then I'm not going to I'm not going to go ahead and say that, that that we do not have the best health care in the world and there's no reason why we should pay, you know, 200% of what some other people do. So well, let's attack the costs of why the chip program is expensive. It not, but not ch- attack the children. Let's attack the healthcare companies that are making record profits, and, and the, div- uh, the the dividends payouts to shareholders are higher than they have ever been. That's a place where we can go, as opposed to attacking programs like this. Yep, and you're right. And I have a I have a quick clip I want to play. You know, from a news program. And yes, this is this is not like Fox News or CNN. This is just a news program where the anchors are actually concerned about what's going to happen. In a few months, around 35,000 children in Idaho could be without health coverage after Congress let the Children's Health Insurance Program expire. Known as CHIP, the program provides health insurance for children and families with low and moderate incomes. There's really no good reason that, that Congress didn't meet that deadline. So we'll be working over the coming weeks to ensure that CHIP is renewed and that kids can continue to go and see the doctor. The federal government has funded most of the program, with states contributing a marginal amount. If funding isn't restored, kids in the program won't be able to see a doctor for routine checkups, immunizations, and other services. One of the fundamental areas of care in uh, the medical home is really to provide stability. And that stability is best when kids have continuous health care coverage. Advocates are hopeful Congress will pass the Kids Act, legislation that would extend funding for CHIP for five years. Kids will be able to see a doctor when they need to. They'll get prescription eyeglasses. And if something really serious occurs, they can go to the hospital. State health officials say Idaho's current CHIP program has funding through January. Stephanie Hill Lopez, 6 on your side. And that's that's what's crazy, right? We just we just heard a news for and this is Idaho. Like so you know, I, I did this on purpose, right? I went out of my way to find something from not Michigan, not you know I mean we're talking about Idaho. These people are concerned about their kids losing health insurance. And this is uh, definitely you know That's definitely that's red country there, boy. Yeah, this is definitely not like this, you know, super hey pro Hillary state. 
And so what if Congress fails? And Congress did fail. I mean, we're now talking about how they failed, how long it's going to run. Idaho basically says they got money until January. In January, they run out. What's going to happen? And and we could talk about, you know, the banking crisis, right? What happened when that happened? Look what failed when that happened. Bailout, baby. Well, and where did the bailout come from? The federal government. So now we're talking about the Congress failing to do anything. anything But they'll bail out the really, really rich banker guys. I mean, they'll they'll do it. They they know there's no way that the banks could fail, and then then there would be somebody to come in and uh, you know a startup or small businesses come in and take care of those. I mean, it's absurd that, that they're once again they're like I said they're not going after the super rich people at the top who are making tons of money. They're going after whether or not the poor people should have any cover. So here's here's something really cool. It says uh um the con this is a key congressional decision whether or not to con- to continue chip funding and for how long. So ending chip. Would, uh, would lead to coverage losses more than a million children. Uh, unless they are moved to Medicaid, children losing their chip coverage will face higher cost sharing. These children are over- overwhelmingly concentrated in families with low income besides uh, th- with below uh, twice the poverty level. So there's the poverty level, which is at like I think 22. So these are families that are um, mostly in under $40,000 for the whole family. Um, and uh, the MACPAC, it'll be included in one of the links. I can't remember exactly what that acronym stands for. It, it'll be um, – they, they recommend extending it through 2022, which would be sufficient time to allow lawmakers to address the question of whether CHIP should continue as an independent funding source or incorporate it into a larger, more unified health insurance subsidy program, which is what like the single-payer system or some kind of modification of the ACA. But they see that this still has to continue going on. Otherwise, one million children immediately uh, once the last state – like. Like Idaho was in January, Nevada was November, I think, or December, and um, some of the other states were getting close to uh, the spring. So, a million children once the last state runs out of the last bits of money it has, unless it can make it up. Uh, there's no reason why this shouldn't keep going. Exactly, and and you know, as as a, as our show wraps up for the night, and and we've had a great night. I, I just I don't understand why all these people want to disenfranchise children, like. We had to and why are we with, fighting more? Yeah, why, why are, are we, we fighting, fighting more about more? this? Where's where's the national news coverage about how many children? Why are we having to do this? Where the fuck's the Daily Show? Or maybe you know, <laughs> how about even John Oliver? Hey, John Oliver, Q here, buddy. Why the hell yeah. are you not talking about this? Because as the Mac Pack noted, Congress also has to consider certain types of targeted pilot projects to enable states to better integrate chip and marketplace plans. But if they repeal Obamacare, they don't have to do any of that. They have to do none of that. None of that has to happen. And we're all going to sit here and watch the downgrade of medical health care coverage for people. So if we can start piloting these things. The full repeal is 30 million people right out of the gate. Exactly. Exactly. And if we can start actually piloting new programs or figuring out better ways, great. But if you're going to sit here and worry about how much money is going to be coming off the top and where it's going to come from, all we can do is say, hey, Congress, if you don't extend this, we got nothing better to work with. And instead of investing in fucking national war programs and, and sitting there saying, hey, let's employ more people in the national war, you know, triad. We can sit here and actually worry about children. We can sit here and worry about the health care coverage of those. Why are we the nation that ranks 16th in health care coverage over the whole world? Why? Why? How can we even be that bloody nation when we have so much other power and intelligence? So any of the trip, chip funding and transition program for kids does nothing more than take us country another step back and does nothing to make us great again. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night, and we'll see you next week with another amazing Cellar Door Skeptics. Have a good night, everyone. You've been listening to a presentation of Cellar Door Skeptics. Check us out on Spreaker, cellardoorskeptics.com.